Hi, Marcy. Hi, Bob. How are you? I'm doing okay. How are you? Doing all right. Okay, let me introduce us. I'm Robert Wright of Blogging Heads TV. You are Marcy Wheeler, famous lefty blogger, um, possibly most famous for blogging at Fire Dog Lake for a number of years, but now you're blogging at your own site, EmptyWheel.net. Is that right? That's right, yeah. And you're not the only one who blogs there, but you are the only one who blogs under the byline Empty Wheel. So you are the Empty Wheel at EmptyWheel.net. I've been empty wheel for like five or six years now, yeah. Wow. So we're going to talk um, about uh, this, um, this alleged Iranian plot to assassinate the Saudi ambassador on American soil and possibly blow up a restaurant um, in the process or whatever. Um, and I think the story is important for a couple of reasons. One is that... Uh, People who favor military action against Iran over its nuclear program are invoking this as an additional reason to attack. I, I think um, uh, Bill Crystal called this something like a gold embossed invitation for military action or something like that. Um, and I don't think an attack is imminent, but if in the future months, you know, there, uh, there is more and more talk that, it, that Israel should bomb Iran or something, you can, you can bet that this... Uh, this will be invoked rhetorically. Um, and then the other interesting thing about this is that there are people who have doubts um, about the American government's kind of story about it, or at least their theory of, of, of what exactly was going on, you know, their reading of, of the uh, evidence they have. You are one of the doubters, mm -hmm. and although the story has kind of fallen out of the mainstream headlines, you have stayed on the case, I think. And... and and I have to admit, I haven't paid really close attention to the details. So I'm, a, I'm in, in that sense, a good interrogator for you uh, because I, I have the level of knowledge that the average viewer has probably. So I was just hoping to kind of ask you some questions about it um, and educate myself, if that's okay. Sounds great. Okay. So um, for starters, what is, what, is the, what is the U.S. government saying happened? What's the kind of thumbnail summary of their – their claim about what the evidence adds up to? Um, their claim is that a guy by the name of Mansour Arbabsiar, who is, um, he's a dual citizen, he's got, he's a naturalized American citizen, uh, was a longtime used car salesman in South Texas, uh, but he's the cousin of one of the top people in Quds Force, so in, in Iran's special forces. And mm -hmm. they're claiming that he approached somebody he thought was a member of Los Zetas cartel, that one of the Mexican drug cartels, mm -hmm. and tried to arrange ultimately, and, and this isn't how it was supposed to have started, but he tried to arrange ultimately the assassination of the Saudi ambassador to the United States. And so that, okay. that was arranged in July, mm -hmm. and um, money did pass hands, but, it, but again, it's, um, the government's case on the money is, is not as good as everyone says it is. And then, um, and then it kind of waited and waited and waited. And then in September, the purported uh, Los Zetas member in Mexico said, come down here, I want you to guarantee the money or else we won't assassinate the ambassador. He went down and was ultimately arrested by the United States. And mm -hmm. so that's, that's what's happened since uh, it, it rolled out for us on October 11th when we found out that he was in custody. Okay. And the government claim is that um – there was actually money, real money, $100,000, transferred from a bank account controlled by the Quds Force, this, uh, this, 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 you know, military group within the, uh, within Iran's military that does covert actions and stuff. Um, and, and, and our government says that the money actually was transferred from a Quds account, and they know that it came from there, and that's... Uh, do, do you contest that part? I do, actually. Um, well, I, I don't contest that that's what the government is claiming, and uh -huh. I don't contest that that's what the government says they have proof of. But what they've shown us in what's in it, he the, uh, in the complaint, so that the it's basically an affidavit that the FBI um, put together of what they know. Um, in the complaint, they they basically show only um, this guy named Individual One who was not 
named in the complaint. He was not charged, nor was he among a list of five people that Treasury sanctioned after this came out. So what they show in the complaint is money kind of landing in his bank account. We don't know from where. And then being forwarded from his bank account to basically an FBI bank account in the United States. So um, this, is a, this is an unnamed Iranian yeah. uh, who, who controlled the bank account. Well, then, is, is it only through the, through the kind of journalistic reporting about the story that we've heard that the government believes, that the government claims that the bank account was controlled by the Quds Force? Because that is out there, right? I mean, yeah, in that, other words, that yeah. is not in any official documents the government has released, but it has been reported that our government asserts that. Yeah, we've seen two pieces of evidence. One is that it came from a guy who, um, again, wasn't charged, wasn't sanctioned. The government basically is suggesting he's innocent in this affair. And we saw in the complaint being transferred from this guy to the FBI. So somebody, we, I mean, we basically saw the money after it allegedly left the hands of the Quds Force, except insofar as this guy, our Bob C.R., transferred it. Um, and then the other piece of evidence in the complaint is that our Bob C.R. in his confession said that the money came from, from the other person who was charged in this, a guy by the name of, of Golem Shakuri, who is, is somebody who is tied, he's described by the government as a Quds Force case officer, so the guy who was basically handling him. Um, so those are the two pieces of evidence. If you buy the, if you buy our, Bar, our Bob Ciar's confession, then sure they've they've shown the case. But what they haven't shown, which I fully expect that they have, because we know that they have this kind of level of detail on money transfers, what mm -hmm. they haven't shown us in the complaint is what what could force bank account the money came from before it went to this individual one guy. Now, but but are you saying you you believe they probably do have that information or? Uh, or do you doubt that they can even, in the end, show that it came from a Quds Force bank account? Uh, if it did, in fact, come from the Quds Force, I assume that they have um, the money transfer information they've been tracking on terrorist finance since 9-11. Since um, but that's one of the problems with this case and one of the problems that the government has more generally of late with its counterterrorism efforts, which is that they show us certain pieces of detail or not at all, and then they leak a bunch of things to journalists without actually showing, showing journalists the evidence. And mm -hmm. between those two things, they say, well, we've made our case. Um, mm -hmm. and, they, and they haven't. And, you know, if this goes to trial, we might actually see the, the money transfer going back to Quds Force. But right now, they haven't shown us that. So if, um, if it doesn't go to trial, mm -hmm. and you might – argue that the government hopes it won't go to trial, if indeed the, their actual evidence is as scanty as you suspect it may be, um, then we won't ever see evidence for even the, the fundamental claims of the, of the case, right? Not all of them, at least. Right. Right. And, and we should actually take a, a step further back even still, um, because there's another important thing that the complaint shows, uh, which shouldn't be under under which shouldn't be contested at all, which is that the, the confidential informant, the, the guy who purportedly was a member of Los Santos but was actually working for us, he for, came he was up working with, for the D, He was working for the DEA, right? Mm -hmm. he, was a, he was a narc. Right, right. Um, That's what I call okay. him is narc because it's, it's short, right? It's, it's but, short, yes. But um, he came up with the splashiest details in this case, and actually the details that, that – that were behind the way this got charged. So, for example, you see taped conversations between him and our Bob CR, and he's saying, well, I could blow him up or I could shoot him. And our Bob CR is saying, yeah, whatever. Um, and so it's basically, uh, it's not like, even if the government, everything the government says is true, it's not like the Iranians said, we want to kill the Saudi ambassador in a spectacular explosion in a restaurant in Washington, D.C., also populated by 150 civilians and some senators. They, right. they're, that, that, that stuff all came from us, came from the U.S. government. There's, there should be no contest about that because that's what you're, you're saying. Was. All of this, all of this, all of these ideas came from the NARC? Yeah, yeah. And that, that's actually on the record that he's leading the witness in that sense? In other words, leading this, this, uh, this used car dealer, our Bob C.R.? I mean, I thought that, that, that we hadn't seen that 
part, we hadn't seen a detailed enough transcript because there are these conversations, the early conversations between the narc and our Bob CR, we do not have records of, and maybe the government is even claiming they were not tape recorded, right? The government is claiming the informant did not tape record them. I would suggest it's highly unlikely that the government doesn't have it recorded in one fashion or another. It seems because, kind of odd yeah. that, that, that they wouldn't start pretty early on. If the guy, if indeed the guy showed up and said, could, could you guys off the Saudi ambassador, you know, you'd think that the next conversation they may, might take pains to, uh, to record. But, well, um, and, and, yeah. and I, you know, I'd go further back and say, what are the chances that an Iranian with ties to Quds Force, with ties to, you know, one of our big enemies, who has a, a pretty consistent, low-level run-in with the law kind of background, what are the chances that, who incidentally just moved back to Iran about a year and a half ago, what are the chances that we didn't have him under very close surveillance in the first place? None. Okay. Okay, so, it, so there are kind of two basic sets of questions, I, I think, that, that you and, and other skeptics are raising. One, as you said, is about the money. What do we know about where it came from? Who was controlling it? And by implication, you know, how high up the Iranian hierarchy authorization for this might have come, okay? Mm -hmm. And then the second set of evidence is surrounding the interaction between the DEA agent and our Bob Zr. And, and the question is, wait a second, who, uh, who really initiated the idea for this plot? And, and, uh, and let me say that, you know, even if, uh, our Bob CR was kind of led into this. In other words, well, let, let me sketch out the theory as I understand it. One theory is that our Bob CR approached the drug cartel in hopes of just doing a drug deal. And it may have involved uh, Iranian officials because Iran intercepts a lot of heroin uh, from Afghanistan. And you can imagine um, uh, corrupt officials wanting to make money off of it. Uh, so maybe our Bob Ziar did have authorization to do that, or maybe he was freelancing and thought, well, if I can, if I can get this into the deal nailed down, I know I can go back and find through my cousin or whoever a bunch of heroin to sell these guys. But for but whatever the specifics, one idea is our Bob Ziar approaches the, the drug cartel just about a drug deal. He has the misfortune to approach a DEA agent, and the DEA agent is told by his handlers uh, see whether, you know, see whether his overlords in Iran have any interest in terrorism. And so th that's one scenario, is, is that the DEA agent kind of led him along. Now, even if that's true, that he was, that we were leading the witness, it is still possible that ultimately when he reported this idea back to Iran or whatever, it did get buy-in from the Kuds, uh, somebody high up in Kuds or somebody somewhere in the government. In other words, it's possible that, that the, the, uh, the interaction between our Bob CR and the DEA is not quite what our government is saying in terms of how the plot was actually hatched, but nonetheless it did lead to evidence that there is willingness at some level of the Iranian government and even eagerness maybe to do things like assassinate Saudi am ambassadors on U.S. soil, right? Yeah, and, absolutely, and which is no minor thing. I mean, I don't mean to right. diminish this if true. What I'm trying to do is to, to point to some significant holes in the case and have, you know, it seems to me the government would it be, it'd be in their best interest to do certain things to shore up their case. Um, they should have done it before they made an international incident about it, but, it, you know, at this point it still would be nice if they provided – enough evidence to back up their case. There's, mm -hmm. there's also even an interim story as well, which is that even according to the government's case, um, our Bob Siar was originally directed by his cousin not to kill the Saudi ambassador, but to kidnap him. And then somewhere again in these untaped or you know, purportedly untaped early conversations, it evolved from a kidnapping to an assassination. Um, mm -hmm. And, and that, that, again, is what's in the, in the government's own case, even assuming that, you know, Abrab CR wasn't led into it, or, you know, that there wasn't. I mean, I, I think there are other possibilities 
even still. I mean, I, you know, I said before that our Bob CR very clearly is the kind of person that we would target in the United States. Somebody to target for intelligence. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody with, w the government is on the record saying that they will use surveillance to find evidence of crimes completely unrelated to terrorism, so I think drugs are, are, are relevant here, to then use to uh, force people to become informants on terrorist groups. And our Bob Sierra would fit right into that profile. Um, and so, you know, the, there's particularly, I mean, one of the posts I did, for example, noted um, the local press, the local newspaper down in, in um, Corpus, Christ, Christ, Corpus Christi, Texas, which is where this guy lived for 20 some years, mm -hmm. um, has the, the local cop saying, funny, the FBI never came to us and asked us about this guy. So quite literally, the way the FBI tells it, of course, um, the, the, this guy out of the blue came to this DE agent and tried to set up an assassination, and they, you know, suggest in that story that they had never heard of our Bob CR in the first place. Mm -hmm. But if that were true, the first thing they would do is go to the cops who have 25 years of history with him and start looking into his criminal record. They didn't do that. They didn't go hunt around in, in Corpus Christi to find out who his so associates were. So, you know, they, I think there's a lot of reason to believe they knew who our Bob CR was to begin with. And then the question is, how did he then come, and, and it is very damning. There's a conversation from July 17th where he clearly, the, the, uh, the narc says, tell me, I mean, this is one of the funny things about the story. The money has already left the hands of the Quds Force at this point, right? Mm -hmm. But still, NARC is saying to Arbab Siar, tell me again what your cousin wants to do. And that's when Arbab Siar, this is, the, this is kind of the, the, the quote that nails him, where he says, my cousin wants you to kill this guy. Um, mm -hmm. So and, and, it's clear and his, he said that. His cousin is the guy named Shalai, who, 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 who is in the Quds Force, uh, but is not the highest level Quds Force that we're claiming is implicated, right? That's a guy, not the highest level guy. The highest level, the higher level guy is Shakuri, is that right? No, Shakuri is the case agent. So Shakuri works for Shalai. Mm -hmm. um, Shalai is okay. like a so higher Shalai up. is the cousin. So he's the highest level person in Kuds who has been named by our government, and he is indeed the cousin of, of uh, our Bob CR. Yeah, although they, the, um, the sanctions that Treasury put together after this came out also named the very top Kuds person. Um, but the there's sanctions, no... The sanctions hmm? did, but we have not actually explicitly alleged that he was involved. Right. He shows up in the complaint in one place where Shakuri, who's the, the case agent, says to our Bob CR, oh, sometime in the future you might get to meet him. Mm -hmm. So th that's okay. the only thing that implicates him. Okay, so let me get clear on the scenario you were just outlining. You were saying we've made it a matter of policy that if we catch somebody involved in any kind of crime we may, that has nothing to do with terrorism, we may try to turn them into an agent, in essence, in, in uh, unearthing terrorist plots and stuff. So that, that is part of, of America's M.O. at this point, right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and so you're suggesting that, uh, consistent with that, it could be the case that um, – uh, indeed, our Bob Ziar approached uh, the cartel with nothing about terrorism. And then, and then is the next step in this scenario that they say to our Bob Ziar, listen, we could throw you in prison right now for a really long time, or you could help us see if there's somebody in Iran who wants to do bad things on the terrorist front. Is that the idea that we immediately uh, enlist him? In the, in the thing, or does he remain a kind of, in, in this scenario, does he remain a kind of unknowing tool uh, in the investigation? In other words, we just suggest to him, hey, you know anybody who's interested in terrorism? Yeah, I think anything, I think any of those scenarios, I mean, it's possible that we've been working with him since he moved back to Iran a year and a half ago. It's possible that after oh, he see. tried to, to, to put together an opium deal, we recruited him to, to try and put together a terrorism plot. It's possible, and, and here's, here's one more of my complaints with the, with the record that we've got from the government. Our Bob Sierra was arrested on September 29th and purportedly waived his Miranda rights every day for 12 days straight. Mm -hmm. And in that 12-day period, he uh, 
confessed, wrote a written statement, and also made three phone calls back to Shakuri in, in Iran and got him speaking in coded language about this $100,000 transfer. And that, you know, so that's, that's the one other thing that ties the $100,000 back to Shakuri, but it's all in code. Um, but the thing is, nobody has explained why he was willing to cooperate so quickly. Why he, I mean, this guy's been in trouble mm -hmm. with the law on at least five different occasions. Every single time, even for something fairly minor, he got a lawyer. So why, for something mm -hmm. that, that, that risks putting him away for life, did he waive his right to a lawyer for 12 days straight and implicate himself further in the crime? Because the, mm -hmm. the, 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 four, the five charges that were charged, four of them are conspiracy charges. So no, those wouldn't have been possible without Shakuri's implication. And Shakuri was implicated largely because of our Bob Sears testimony. So in other words... Okay. The, the, the government hasn't explained to us why that's why that's feasible, um, mm -hmm. and there are a number of there are a number of situations that could explain it. One is that we arrested him on opium charges and threatened to send him away to a maximum security prison and said, if you cooperate right away, we'll make sure that you get sent to a medium security and you get time off for good behavior. And that's, I mean, that I think is also a plausible scenario. So all of these are plausible. It's just mm -hmm. that we, you know, that the, the case is so funny that we, there's no reason we should trust it until some of these questions get answered. Okay, so it's in September of this year he was arrested. Do we know, know when the first communications with the DEA agent were? How far back this goes? According to the complaint, their first meeting was May 24th. Um, okay. But that's, you know, that's weird, too. Like, what are the chances that a guy tries to reach out to Los Cedos and ends up reaching out to a DEA guy? He is, you know, independent reporting, so not the, um, not the complaint, says that he knew the DEA agents, the DEA narcs aunt in Corpus Christi, which, again, is another weird reason that, you know, you would think that they would start investigating him in Corpus Christi and didn't. Um, and so he knew her going back some time. And, you know, again, if, if the FBI has been tracking this guy, as I think is likely, I wouldn't be surprised if she was one of the people tracking him. So um, the first meeting that is in the complaint between NARC and our Bob CR is May 24th. Allegedly, this plot started in, in, um, in Iran. Allegedly, uh, Shalai, the cousin, gave Arbatsi an order to go find some cartel members who would do bad stuff um, back in early spring, February time frame. So that's how long the government says the plot's been going on. Okay. And does the government ever explicitly say that the way it worked is our Bob CR approached this guy and his initial idea was can you, you know, terrorist related, uh, is that an explicit government claim in, the, in their official uh, documents? As, you, know, you know, in other words, in other words, are they, are they explicitly denied that we actually drew him, that we actually, you know, diverted his attention to a terrorist plot when his initial enthusiasm was about a drug plot? Um, they don't mention drugs at all in the complaint, although, again, leaked you know, administration sources leaking to journalists have said that there was also an opium deal that was negotiated at the same time. So the, mm -hmm. the complaint leaves all mention of opium aside. But is its, um, wording, is its wording about their terrorism-related communications uh, sufficiently unambiguous that, that they are clearly saying, look, he first approached this DEA agent with terrorism in mind. Are we, have we explicitly said this, our government? Um, it's a little more subtle than that. They said in that first May 24th uh, conversation, our Bob CR asked about NARC's uh, experience with explosives. So mm. at that level, the, 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 the claim is that our Bob CR was the first person to ask about explosives. In mm -hmm. response, NARC said, well, you know, I've got C4. Um, so that's, that's the basis of the WMD claim, actually. That and, and uh, NARC's offering up that he was going to blow up this restaurant. That's how WMD cases are made against uh, alleged terrorist plotters in this country. Um, and the multiple civilian deaths, again, came from NARC. And then there's this period. Uh, so so Arbatsir leaves Mexico and comes back in June. 
um, possibly having gone back to Iran and negotiating all ne negotiated all this with uh, with his cousin and so on, and then the government says, well, in a series of conversations, here are some topics that were discussed, among other things. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there is allusions to, you know, again, there are reports that this plot supposedly included uh, taking out the, um, the Saudi and Israeli embassies in Argentina, which, of mm -hmm. course, Quds Force has a background of, you know, Hezbollah has a background of doing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so they kind of lay out, there were lots of bad st things that they talked about, and then on July 14th and July 17th, it kind of crystallized as an assassination. Um, before that, the money had already left Quds Force hands, according to the complaint. And then there's, you know, all of the discussions after, uh, after July 17th that we get from the complaint are in code. And so you need to buy the government's claim that uh, Chevrolet's code for, for the assassination, which, which Chevrolet Reportedly, um, our Bob CR said was a code in his in his confession. There's another code that the FBI agent decided on his own was code for the assassination. So, you know, there's just those two conversations really on July 14th and July 17th that, that really are the, the the crystal of this mm -hmm. of this of these charges and the money that got transferred. But it got transferred before the the actual plot got crystallized, um, and then coded conversations and our Bob CR's confession. But our government does claim that in the very first conversation between our Bob Ziar and the DEA, our Bob Ziar brought up explosives. Absolutely, which, yeah. Which would not be consistent with the idea that the DEA, that the narc goes back to his handlers and says, hey, this guy's from Iran and he wants drugs, and they say to him, you know, ask about terrorism. Um, right. So, right. And, and you, kind of, you kind of wouldn't expect just a narc. I mean, and he, he's a... The narc himself had, had gotten into the narc business by virtue of having had a criminal record himself. Is that right? Yeah, that's how everyone gets in the narc yeah, business. So, yeah, that's, that's, so he's there to catch drug guys. You wouldn't expect him on his own to come up with this idea that you might get them interested in, um, in terrorism, right? Um, well, you know, who, who knows? Like, who knows yeah. what, his, what his aunt said to him? It'd be really nice to have taped conversations or at least a more fleshed out version of that conversation. I mean, that's when you, when, you know, I've, I've, I've covered a lot of these um, stings of these, you know, like most of the terrorism plots in the United States are stings just like this, where an informant um, kind of talks, in, usually it's about a 19-year-old Muslim man, talks this kind of uh, down and out Muslim man along and ultimately provides him the explosives, gives him a phone, and once he presses the button to explosives that aren't even tied to the phone, then we arrest him. So that's kind of what the basis of most of the terrorism plots in this country have become. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, and, and there is a, there is an unfortunate history in these cases where important conversations don't get taped. So for me, having followed these, it was a red flag right away that these early conversations weren't taped because the FBI has a real habit of not taping conversations that hurt their case. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's important. You know, like there's a case in, in Oregon where the, like this sort of, the very first conversation where the, where the alleged terrorist voiced his interest in, in carrying out uh, an explosion in the United States was they had a tape malfunction. Mm -hmm. You know, so th th those of us who watch these aren't surprised to find conversations not taped here. Okay, and then and then to get back to the other other key piece of kind of contested interpretation, um, the money. Um, let me make sure I understand you that, that the government has not said in any officially released documents uh, this money was released from a bank account controlled by Kuds. Is that right. what you're saying, that, that, that they, they actually word it more artfully than that in the official documents, and it's just that reporters have been told by government officials, uh, uh, not, uh, anonymous sources, that it was uh, controlled by Kuds? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, basically, we know Shikori knew that money had been transferred, so that's pretty mm -hmm. damning. We yeah. know, um, you know, our Bob Sierra's confession says that Shikori gave him the $100,000. That's damning. But the mm -hmm. actual transfer information that they give us show it going, show it already out of the hands of Kuds Force. Mm -hmm. They show it going from this guy, Individual One, 
through two, uh, they're called foreign entities in the, in the complaint. We're, mm -hmm. you know, we're led to believe they're Iranian entities. So they go mm -hmm. from this guy, individual one, through these uh, two foreign entities, through a bank in Manhattan, which is why this is being, why this is being charged in Manhattan, among other reasons, um, into a fake FBI bank account. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, I would say, you know, kind of, I guess, in defense of the government's case slightly, which is that so that the the weird the weird el one of the many weird el I mean people have argued in various ways that this just doesn't sound like something Iran would do. I mean, a there's a question of whether it's really in their strategic interest to do this particular act, uh, you know, even though they've done some things like this. And then b would they do it this way? Approach a Mexican drug cartel? I mean, I, I will say although that part sounds kind of crazy to me, um, you can imagine Kuds getting into this. Uh, kind of stumbling into it uh, by by virtue of the way you interpret um, the, the 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 interaction with the with the DEA agent um, and Arbabziar. In other words, mm -hmm. if they say if if, the, if it starts off as a drug thing and Arbabziar says, by the way, uh, these guys say that you know they can do any kind of terrorism we want. You can imagine some mid to high level guy in Kuds Force going, wow, you know, I never would have initiated like a triple bank shot like this, but if this has fallen into our lap, that's a pretty easy way to get stuff done. I can imagine that actually being the case. So there is this possibility that our government is kind of misleading us about how the plot was hatched, and yet you do wind up with Kuds uh, buying into this very unorthodox me means of getting an attack done on American soil. That's at least possible, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I think there are four very legitimate possibilities, one of which is exactly what the government says, with the caveat that the details, the really splashy details of this, very clearly come from the government itself. Uh -huh. And the timing does, too. I mean, that's something else that people should, should remember. The, the, the big pieces of evidence in this case were all delivered to the FBI by August 9th. And so the government sort of waited and, and strung out our Bob CR, and then ultimately, you know, there was a conversation in August that they tell us about, but don't show us, where our Bob CR first talked about maybe having to go guarantee the money. Mm -hmm. It's not until the end of September where he does that. Then they have him for um, 12 days. And even in those 12 days, the, the last piece of intelligence that they collect in those 12 days was on September, on October 7th, and it's not until October 11th that they, that they spring this on the world community. So, mm -hmm. I mean, there, it's very clear that the government controlled how this came about and how they would then turn around and, and use it as an opportunity call for sanctions. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, don't, I don't see how you can contest that. I mean, and, and one of the things that technically there is no evidence of in the complaint, although I think you could assume it, is, um, there is no evidence, even assuming that, that the Quds Force wanted to go assassinate a Saudi ambassador, there's no evidence that they chose to do it in the United States. Mm -hmm. That that may have come from NARC as well. And, and that's right. the basis that we've used to therefore call this, you know, an act of war against the United States. Now, the, the logic, if you, if you go to Quds Force and say, we want to go after the Saudi ambassador who lives in D.C., the logic would be that you'd hit him in D.C., but it's not even clear that that I mean, the government doesn't give us any evidence that 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 the Iranians even asked mm -hmm. for that. Yeah, there is, by the way, a theory that if they did want to do it on American soil, if they liked that idea, it might have been um, in retaliation for the assassination of uh, a number of nuclear scientists on Iranian soil, presumably by Israel, but perhaps. Uh, Iran would suspect American complicity in what were presumably Israeli attacks. That's one thing um, I've heard. But uh, so, you know, your 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 skepticism. I mean, there are various kind of. Uh, it sounds like you're kind of agnostic about what actually happened. Um, yeah. And certainly, not all of the scenarios. Uh, not not all of the doubts you're raising entail um, the government, I, I guess I'm asking, to what extent do you suspect that our government, that the U.S. government is, is kind of misinterpreting evidence, and to what extent do you think it is 
intentionally misleading people about what it knows happened? I, I think it's some of both. I mean, at the very least, although Preet Bharara, who's the U.S. attorney from New York, did admit in the press conference that um, it sounded like a Hollywood plot, that the restaurant was fictional, um, which I think at least suggests or foregrounds the fact that a lot of these details came from the informant, uh, mm -hmm. they're sort of letting the story ignore that fact. They're not emphasizing mm -hmm. that fact because it doesn't serve their purposes. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot of the other doubts that I have about on what basis are Bob's here cooperated and so forth. But there are actually even pieces in the transcript where you could dispute, given, given the transcript outside of context, you could dispute the FBI agent's interpretation of them. So, for example, I mentioned earlier that there's purportedly a code, Chevrolet, which is meant to mean the assassination. And, th and that's one of the only things they have really implicating Sh Shakuri himself. Mm -hmm. And in that conversation, though, uh, he, uh, the, the, the FBI is pretty clearly trying to get our Bob CR to convince him to send more money so that we have better evidence against him. In that conversation, um, Shakuri actually says, well, you know, I've already, somebody in the, the it's inaudible purportedly, right? Somebody just gave me another car. And so if car is supposed to be the code for assassination, that would suggest that he's already gotten a, the assassination he wanted, that somebody's already died, and we don't mm -hmm. know of any prominent Saudi that has died. So, you that know, is odd. that's a weird, there's, that's weird. There's another example where um, it's supposed to be evidence that the Iranian government is paying for this. And, um, and our Bob Sears English is not great. That's pretty clear from the transcript. So this might be an ESL, and you know, that, that he's speaking not his primary language. But mm -hmm. there's this point where he says, oh, these people, and the FBI agent interprets that to mean the Quds Force, these people pay this government. And he's saying that means the Iranians pay the Quds Force, but grammatically it means Quds Force is paying some other paying. government. Right. And, and given that Quds Force is the entity that bribes, for exa example, the Taliban mm -hmm. or, or Afghanistan, it could mean something else. Um, and outside of the context of the larger transcript, we can't tell. Mm -hmm. Is there, I mean, you've covered cases like this, and, and you sounds like you know more about uh, criminal law proceedings than I do. Is there a reason the government... Uh, you know, assuming it does plan to bring this to trial, is there a reason it, it couldn't just release more information now of the sort that it is purported to have that would that could might actually convince us? Yeah, you know, it's unfortunate. They the, this was originally a criminal complaint, which means the government made this into an international incident even before it had been approved by a grand jury. So, in other mm -hmm. words, it it turned this into a national event before actual citizens reviewed some of the evidence and said, yeah, this this makes sense. I think they, they clearly, ha you know, even then had a good enough case to get by the grand jury because, you know, there's that famous line, grand juries could indict a ham sandwich. It right. clearly passed the ham sandwich level. And, and the, there has been an indictment handed down since then. But the indictment is, right? is, is completely void of any details beyond what are already in the complaint. And I think that's unfortunate. I think the government should have given – a little more detail to answer some of the questions that were already out there, and they ended and, up and not it, doing it. And it could? I, I, in other words, this, this, is there any downside from the government's point of view, you know, if it does plan to bring it to court or whatever? Is there any downside in theory from the government's point of view of actually just bringing out more evidence right now? If they've got it, there shouldn't be. But, you know, by the same token, they probably should have released officially their authorization, their justification for um, killing Anwar al which is a very similar case where I think the government believes in secrecy to such a degree that they don't see how it hurts their credibility on issues like this. And so, you know, I think it's – they should. I think they could. Mm -hmm. But it's not atypical of this administration that they haven't. Mm -hmm. So there's a good chance uh... – I mean, because the only person who's in our custody who's been indicted is our Bob C.R., right? Yeah, as far as, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and so if he does a, a, a plea bargain, there may never be a trial, and we may never see more evidence. Yeah, I, um, th there's actually, there, I don't know if you remember, but there was a, there was a claim that uh, Gaddafi was trying to kill then Crown Prince Abdullah of Saudi Arabia back in 2003 or four. And I actually mm -hmm. went back to that docket of the, of the American who provided the evidence for that. 
And same deal, he was arrested on charges, he didn't get bail, and in that period when he didn't get bail, he eventually came around to cooperating, and then in the process gave up all this evidence about, a, about an assassination plot. Um, he actually just got his sentence reduced in July, this earlier guy. Um, and, I, and I think that's sort of what we would see in this case. I mean, I think what would, and it's, it's actually more likely this guy is going to, that our Bob CR is going to sign a plea agreement because he's already spent 12 days cooperating with the government. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you, you would assume that they, that whatever they told him to mm -hmm. make him cooperate uh, included some real incentives to do so. And those are the kinds of things that lead to plea deals. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, um, and, and that, I mean, there's one other thing that the government could do to, I mean, to, to kind of give us more evidence or give us more reason to believe this case, which is that they still haven't unsealed our Bob CR's first uh, complaint, what they used to arrest him. Mm. Um, and that, too, might give us some, some explanation for why it is that a guy who hires lawyers every time a police looks at him funny didn't do so in this in this circumstance. It may be that the the original complaint included all of the opium charges that we're kind of hypothetically saying may have been there, and that would at least give us an you know that it would at least give us an explanation for what he traded off mm -hmm. to cooperate. Okay. Um, all right, and you know finally on another note, uh, Iran has uh, claimed that one of these Iranian guys, I guess, Shakuri. Shakuri is actually uh, associated with the MEK, this, I guess, Iranian exile group that aspires to overthrow the Iranian government. And, and, and that, I, most people I know are not attaching much credibility to that claim. Uh, it, it's interesting because the MEK, um, um, again, right now, people who favor military action against Iran are, are working to change the MEK's legal status in America. Right now, the MEK is considered a terrorist group because it's done terrorist things. And they want to, uh, the advocates of war want it to get, uh, want us to delist the MEK. In other words, make it a legitimate group that we could then support uh, as they try to overthrow the Iranian government. Iran is now claiming that one of the key guys in this plot was actually an MEK guy which would raise the scenario that this was a false flag operation, well, you know, designed, uh, the, the, uh, designed to convince people that Iran was doing something it's not really doing. Again, I don't know many people who attach a lot of credibility to that, but have you looked into that or thought about it much? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't attach much credibility to it. We do have a history of being fooled by the MEK. Um, the, you mm -hmm. know, the last time we tr we tried to ratchet up war against Iran, there was a there was a laptop um, that was nicknamed, nicknamed the laptop of death, which was as kind of suspicious as this story is. And mm -hmm. there were reports that that came from the MEK, and we used it to to claim that Iran was further along their their uh, their nuclear program. But I also think, I mean, it, it's very easy to imagine why Iran would do that. You know, so if they if they got caught and want to claim plausible deniability up the chain of command, the easy way mm -hmm. to do that is to sacrifice Shakuri, say he was a spy, kill right. him or whatever, and then they can go and continue trying to make peace with the rest of the world or bombing the rest of the world or what have you. Um, so, it's a, you know, it seems like it's, it's not surprising. It seems very convenient for them in any case. Um, I'm not surprised. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, listen, thanks a lot for taking the time, Marcy. Um, I've learned a lot, and uh, it's made me wish uh, more intensely than ever that our government would release more information about this. You and but me I'm not optimistic on that front. <laughs> yeah, I, exactly. Yeah, I mean, and that's the, I mean, I think that's sort of where I come down on this is that you can argue about the policy one way or another. Um, and what we should do if this is in fact true. But I just think given the history of bad intelligence that we've had in the last decade, it really behooves the government to give us enough credible intelligence so that we can believe them when they tell these stories. And presumably they have it, so they should just give it to us. That would be nice. Yeah. Well, maybe if you call the White House and ask nicely, Marcy. I, I'll, I'll do that because they listen to me, every, everything I say. <laughs> If, and if you run into any trouble, tell them you have my support. I will. That should do it. Okay, well, thanks again. All right, thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.